and I'll get the recording of this. I scheduled some time right after this to get out the recordings. So I'll, I'll pull them together from the last couple and this one, try and push them out right after this course hour as well. I can do that. That would be super great. So for those of you who read the article, you could at least at the very least skim the article. A lot of good material in there. And both articles I selected were uh, from Jill Cook, and she's great. She has some great, great podcasts, and you know, like there's on YouTube that are out there. She's Australian, which is fun because she can be a little cheeky at times. So that's always kind of fun to listen to. But she was a podcaster, so they ask an off question. You know, she's a, a little entertaining to hear. But her tendinopathy work and research over the last 20, 30 years, you know, the model holds up pretty well and he's a good sort to have so when i looked at this going over to the neuropathy i did kind of seek out that she put out what did she put out lately her traditional article on like the three phases of tendinopathy came out i think 209 09 in british journal sports medicine and i referenced that toward the back end of that that's a nice one just to look at that in model so for these articles didn't necessarily get into Stimulating forces and tendons. What we're going to see is that, you know, kind of I like think of the three like three things. We have tension and tendon, which is kind of what we always think of. We think of tension and what a tendon is designed to do. That linear tension it takes. We think of the eccentric or negative stresses that go on. We get high tensile forces in the tendon. Compression is something that they really look at when they look at you know when we get these kind of chronic tendinopathies as being one of the big drivers that can occur. So. You know, looking at like you know, compression and gluteal tendinopathy is a common one, the greater trochanter. You know, looking at insertional tendinopathy because the tendon, as it wraps around the insertion point, occur. I think I see this in some of the hamstring tendinosis and tendinopathy that they'll talk about is that it's the way that hamstring tendon can be compressed, initial tuberosity in a squat and setup position that occurs. And that concept of, uh, I think it's or intratendinous compression where the tendon B can become compressed from within or again, externally on, a, on another structure that can happen. External compression in the upper extremity, like some of the examples they talked about are external compression. You know, anything occurs is insertion, wrapped around a bony protuberance or a convex surface. The examples that they mentioned was, you know, the Achilles tendon at the insertion and the glute knee tendinopathy. That's always an interesting one because when MRI came around, the diagnosis of bursitis it dropped a bit because they found that the glute knee tendinopathy almost always occurred in cases of the bursitis. Have uh, tendinopathy in the absence of bursitis, typically not maybe bursitis in the absence. At colonism and, and the bursitis model still works. There's often a tendinopathy associated with, it, but sometimes the bursa can be painful. And the tendon may be non pain. And again, you have compression, you know, the Achilles, they talk about the posterior border of the calcaneus. And again, glute meat on the greater trochanter. And those are, yeah, those are lower extremities. I got lower extremities here. I'll swap it around. Again, lower extremity, you know, upper limbs is long head of the biceps, you know, tendon, you know, and the humeral head and the bicipital groove. You know, we'll talk about that a bit as we get into module covers the shoulder and some of the tests for the uh, compression along the, the biceps tendon. Well, Eric, he'll happily show you. Uh, biceps, uh, you know, tendon, the radial tuberosity and a distal one. Well, for the eccentric carpi radialis, brevis tendon, you know, that'd be along the level of the lateral epicondyle. Which, um, there was, you will find tendinous irritation occurring there and supraspinatus tendon along the humeral head. And greater and uh, greater tuberosity, so the compression model is nice. I mean, a lot of, not a lot of people think of that in that model. What I've really looked at. Pearl compression is a good one, and the other article, the bonus article I put in there, was one on internal compression. Can be a bit tedious and detailed for those of you like tedium and detail, but I got any knocks over the years on the idea that okay, hey, where is the evidence based or there? But it's nice to use practical evidence of why we're doing. And what is the background of why we're, we're doing it? Those articles are nice to give you in the back of our mind as we select our treatment patterns. Oh, I got it. Hey, Patrick, get your voice back, didn't you? Let's hear you, Patrick. Can you repeat that again, Dave? 
I just want to hear your voice just to see if your voice is bad. Oh, so you're kind of the head good. is more clear and I can actually talk today. Yeah, that's pretty good. I mean, I did kind of like the old one. Though. It gave you, gave you a little swagger. <laughs> I'll try and get uh, a nice little punch to the jaw for you before tomorrow. Perfect. And he's learning again. Good. Okay, Patrick. Have you, have you, were you familiar with the concept of the internal compression in a tendon? Um, I can't say that I am. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because you don't see it much, but the model that's out there that's, you know, I say more recent, more recent is like maybe eight years. And look at internal compression, you know, it occurs in the mid substance of a tendon. And, you know, the idea is that here that we have increased intertendinous pressure and, you know, activates the mechanoceptor to by located in the peritendon and connective tissue. So, you know, before we think about compression, like a bone from the outside, here we have compression from within the tendon. And that can be from fluid swelling within the tendon. That can be from you get a area of degenerative change in irregular formation and you know that nodule within the tendon that forms, which you know, in Bill Cook's work, she talks about that those nodules that form aren't necessarily those pathological areas aren't necessarily the painful area. It's the it's the adjacent fibrils that transfer load around that area that tend to become inflamed and irritable is one of the models. So that this pathological area that we may find in the tendon may not be the pain generator, surrounding tissues, which that are now being stressed, become the pain generators. So that's what we'll start to see is that we get this internal compression of the tendon activates the A delta and C fibers. Now we can think about this internal compression of, let's say it's fluid and we have fluid in here because extracellular matrix and it gets irritated. The extracellular matrix starts to draw in extra fluid through this chemical process of different cells put in there, which is what happens. We see it that can happen after the acute injury that that pain process is then generated by this, that swelling effect. I go out, that person, okay, they run 10 miles and they don't normally run 10 miles. Say Achilles tendon starts to take on extra fluid. It's getting inflamed. That fluid in the extracellular matrix and starts to compress these nerve endings and irritate them. It's often why one of the models of the warm-up effect in tendinopathy, if you're thinking of like local effect in the tendon, is that conditioning leads to basically, okay, we're tensioning this tendon in a very controlled manner. Are we now can causing a situation where we can move fluid out of the intertendinous substances, decreasing that intertendinous dynamic pressure in warm-ups? Now we also have the effect of isometrics when we look at tendinopathies as decreasing pain. There's there's also a more a physiological model for pain reduction. With that. But that idea that the low load controlled loading, for say in warm ups, in this person who may have an irritable tendon, is this model that okay if I decrease the fluid exudate within the tendon, decreases that pressure within the tendon and they have decreased pain. The other the other model is. That, okay, well, as we do this, it's in the, that pain modulation cycle that by, okay, now I'm putting tent, you know, stress of these tendon. I got these, these neural fibers in the tendon are now being stimulated at a low level. They now compensate. So there's this neural compensation there where they find that at a cortical level and a midbrain level that, okay, doing warm ups, doing isometrics modulates pain for upwards of eight hours in like basketball players with the teletendinopathy. Oh, that model is that, okay, how much of this pain may also be cortically driven? But an intertendinous pressure is one of the other models that are out there that may be explained why we see this decrease in pain after the warm-ups with tendinopathy. And yeah, this is also talked about, think about these people with tendinopathy having morning stiffness. It's an idea that that fluid reabsorption and accumulation that typically recurs, right? And that's, you know, kind of classic carpal tunnel syndrome model. That, okay, some of this, some of the tissues you absorb this fluid and the tendon, you get neural compression. But this neural fluid model is also seen and it's also described classically with neural inflammation. That nerves that become inflamed or irritated take on extra inter extracellular fluid and that creates interneural compression. That's seen also with you know sciatica. That okay, this pressure can go up. I think it's like 56 old was in the study. They so these pressures can go up considerably 
as we do it, but that same model that occurs in the nerve can also happen within the tendon. And explain some of why at night we've been at rest, why we get these increased fluid absorption into the tendon and we wake up and we have tendinous pain. Oh, I deleted my two cases. Okay, let's put them in right here. Let's talk about this in respect to if we had a runner and a lifter. So let's say we have a 42. Year old male, say, had hip pain. All right, Achilles tendon pain. We got a 34 year old. A male with a uh, right, say right hip pain two months prior or three months prior now has right Achilles pain. And we have a 34 year old female with right extensor tendon pain, a lateral extensor, you know, CrossFit, you know, two times two months for tendon pain. You know, you know, with each of these individuals, we may find that, okay, what is the warm up effect? And, and they're in the runner we may have here is Achilles tendon pain. Now, it would also be classifying, and let's say he's had this pain with the right Achilles. We're going to give him this pain, and we're going to say he's had this Achilles pain two months. It's going to put him in a kind of a subacute phase. You know, the acute phase rest would probably be the most, you know, the most appropriate thing to get that intertendinous swelling down, get it to reset, and get him to calm down. But now that we've had it for a while, it's going on, he hasn't stopped running on it. We're entering into a different phase of the healing cycle. So let's think about the person. Warm up. Okay. Okay, Jacob, what would what would you do with this person who's the 42-year-old male? He's gonna kind of continue to run and he has three out of ten uh release pain. Well, if I'm not gonna stop him from running because that's how runners work. Um, I'm at least going to teach him a proper warm up and mm -hmm. engage that muscle prior and as well as at least educate him on, you know, symptom, uh, build up. Right. So if he is going to run, how can we do like more of a run rock, run walk program? So his mm -hmm. symptoms don't, you know, continue continually to just spike to a irritable level of eight, nine and 10, um, mm -hmm. where he's doing significant damage to the tendon at that point. So um also going to teach him a little bit of uh strengthening on the side um mm -hmm. so daisy's not necessarily running so he can you know overload that tendon um and allow for greater than his current body weight through the tendon to strengthen it and uh going to also teach him some at night probably some remedies to at least help his pain and decrease the swelling mm -hmm. okay good anyone else would add anything to that real quick Do we address the hip at all? I look at it yeah. as far as the hip. Not yet, but you can. Anything, what would you say on the hip? Well, my concern was, is it a, do they have some sort of uh, abnormalities for either motion or strength in that hip that's causing uh, an adverse effect on, on the right foot? Absolutely. That's going to be your driver. So yeah. Your primary diagnosis there is Achilles tendinopathy. One of your contributing etiologies will be the hip. That's most likely probably where this person would be. But we're going to keep this case as we go down. So put these in the back of your mind as we as we, as we see these, because this is what we're going to kind of uh, come into. But earlier, I'm going to think about like, the patterns of what we're seeing here in research. We have pain modulation and understanding, okay, why that pain may sometimes decrease with warm-ups. Sometimes it won't if it's in a more acute state. Again, all the things that kind of occur with the tendon and not just stimulus, you know, highly elevated tendon pathology is... You know, they talk about glutamate and lactate. These are also associated with increased pressures. So, you know, you have these inter intertendous communication. And what happens is this is an example of that fluid is within the tendon, as it shows in that blue area. And you'll see that that fluid is going to increase that intertendinous pressure. And as this tendon contracts and it's compressed, that pressure point goes up. So nerve endings get stimulated, tendon gets damaged. It can also 
you know, this occurs is that it's not just the fact because you have decreased transfer of what limited blood supply it has is now further impaired. And again, one other thing that increases tensile force and tendency to talk about is, again, it's kind of mentioned here, it's shear. That's an idea. If I think of shear, like within tendons, it can be intertendinous if you have, let's say you have a, a, ten, a area of tendinopathy and you have some you know, tendinosis in an area of the tendon, that tendon that shears over top of it, that transferring fibers is going to get shear stresses. And if you don't think about shear stress, think about this. Like if you hit your brakes in a car, you know, your body's pulled forward, but, but your pants and your buttocks create a sheer stress as you're held in your chair by that sheer force. And the runner, it's that ground reaction force and that contact of a foot on the ground allows you to propel forward as you push. If you're on ice and the coefficient of friction is, is relatively zero, so your foot slips right out from under you. So that's a that's a no shear, but your foot has a shear force and contact, keeps your foot slipping, allows you to drive forward. So there is shear that can occur within the tendon, whether it's the tendon over a bony protuberance or it's intratendinous shear that can occur. Now we talk about, you know, what, think a little bit about, okay, both these models with the elbow, we have the Achilles person with the hip etiology. Um, you know, personal markers, you know, how do we measure, you know, per performance to how somebody's getting better with a tendon? You know, commonly what we do is we think of athletic performance, you know, not, re not really looking at load tissue tolerances. So for that runner, you know, we really think about, okay, if they get back to running, you know, pain free and doing well or one out of 10 pain, the same as that CrossFitter who's then able to go into, you know, going into their exercise program you know, without pain. So, you know, their their personal metric may be athletic performance, you know, but as the tendon heals, really what we have these two things, one, measuring their performance, and two, what is the tendon's low tolerance to activity? And that may be one of the things that we need to kind of consider is the global, and this is the runner, and then in our treatment program, we have the subcategory of, you know, what is the right amount of the sweet spot of load potentially for this tendon? And why is it that these loading programs appear to work? So, you no know, global program, not specific to the structure, and local program will be specific to the structure. Both these individuals, you know, we're going to be thinking and talking about what are we doing globally to decrease the forces or get the appropriate tendon stress through this tendon and structure, and then, and then focally, what can we do focally to either relieve the excessive stress that's occurring with the tendon, or, you know, get this person in their appropriate level of stress and again also my habituation program is what's my loading program to eventually elevate this tendon capacity complicating all this is the fact that ethology does not predict pain or movement alterations so they looked at you know basically in multiple studies they look at junior basketball they're demonstrating a lot of these individuals had patella, you know, tendon pathology when they imaged domal ultrasound, MR, I can't remember the one they did, but what they found is that not all of them had pain. And that lots of times these individuals without pain, their movement patterns and force production and generation because they're getting no nociceptive signal or avid signal was essentially the same. And it's how do we then adapt for it? So what occurs in the body to adapt for these, you know, things where now some having decreased load, maybe put through this, we think globally there's adaptation compensation, you know, at more metabolically active tissues, you know, such as okay, what's going on with the muscle or central nervous system. So we're adapting these changes. So we get this variability in, in tendon load or we get a pathology in a tendon, you know, there's local changes where we can transfer load around that area of dysfunction. Then there's that global change of, hey, my body's sensing that I'm, I'm not put, I'm not able to put that tensile load through this tendon the same. I'm going to change or alter my movement strategy to do this. And up above, if you think about the 42-year-old runner, you know, what Chan talked about, really looking at the chicken or the egg here. It's like, okay, my altered hip strategy now potentially created my Achilles tendinopathy. Whereas somebody with an Achilles tension, tensioning problem or pathology 
may also now alter their hip mechanic, you know, to compensate. Does that make sense? Abby, does that make sense? Huh, sure. So sorry, so, there's a lot happening in my clinic right now. Got I'm it. trying to stay engaged. There's you, just you, a lot. Abby, put I, your, fi put your fires out. Stay the best you can, okay? I'm it. trying my best over I, here. I get it, Abby. So we'll pick on Ryan instead. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I'm hanging in there. Yeah. You know, just it's that idea that. I can have a tendinopathy and again, it can be there. It could, it could be, and for most people, you're going to say they're going to have tendon changes and they're going to have no symptoms. Other people will be symptomatic. And then as we watch people move, we're trying to always be chicken or the egg. Do I have something going on in this crossfitter or this runner where they're overloading the Achilles or the extensor tendons due to a movement system impairment? They're moving something. They're, they're not moving well through their hips. Now their elbow is picking up the extra force. So now I have enough of a strain on this system to cause it to be stressed. Or the other potential is, hey, this person just started running, or they just started CrossFit, and this tendon doesn't have the capacity to handle the new load, and now it's being overstressed. So we can see you know, these things. These are just subcategories we think of, okay. Was this tendon ill prepared for the stress, or have I changed something internally that now creates extra stress? Dave, I think it's also worth it to add, like educating your patients on when you're jumping around, because a lot of times they come in with an expectation of, I have foot pain. Why are you even looking at or working on something else? And kind of how you word it, like chicken or the egg, I'll say, who, who cares what came first? Let's address both and mm -hmm. see how the body reacts. And that's kind of normally how I'll get my initial patient buy-in mm -hmm. so that they don't feel like I'm not addressing their concerns or sweeping them under the rug, but still looking at both and, and just kind of making sure there's, there's patient education when you're taking that kind of global view. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And it is. It's. It's what I will generally do is I will. I will focus on their area, and then I'll expound later on these other areas. And sometimes I will make sure that what is their primary concern. Their primary concern is going to be that I can't run, and I run with a running group, and that's my social outlet. And now I can't do that. Or at forty-two, it's like he's going to think, ah, oh, now I've crossed forty and I'm old and broken. Dealing with those things would be the most important thing to kind of keep it their thing. The dealing with the multi-segmental stuff. You can add in later on, but yes, definitely. I think it's a really good point to keep that in. Deal with what their problem is and the patient oriented problem first. And this is, these are the things that are going on in the back of our mind, but it's coming out on the front as this is patient oriented. And eventually we're going to work on your hips because it's going to take the load off your Achilles. And we can show that to them with jumping and movement patterns. Dave, that does make sense. It all just clicked in my head with you saying that. Yeah. So that's where it is. It's that patient centric. I'm going to do a bit of that and probably if I'm back at any of the later ones, I'm going to put a bit more of that in there. How do I model it around the patient? We're going to take all this and say, okay, how do we model it around the patient experience? Again, this idea that I like this when the adaption may occur in the surrounding aligned fibrillar structures rather than the changes in the degenerative area. I think it's really eye-opening if you haven't thought about it in that model, is that you know, Joel Cook's model, it's not the degenerative spot that is naturally the pain generator in these individuals. It is the low transfer of the, of the surrounding tissue. And then what they'll see in these individuals is there is some thickening of those tendon fibrils and the ability to transfer load potentially around that pathological area. And that's those who adapt well. They, they see that this, this aligned fibrillar structure you know, changes, you know, in that, in that structure rather than changes in the, the degenerative area. Okay. Again, this idea too, that research and it can be really confounding as you look at it. That's why it's kind of nice to have this discussion. I know that it's okay to be confounded, 
they read one thing that counteracts another. I hear there's a lot of studies are saying that eccentric training, heavy, slow, resistive training had a little effect on the mechanical properties of the tendon. Changes in mechanical properties they think are the likely candidate of why they'd be seen as adaptation to the pathology. The current evidence really doesn't state that, hey, I, I do this heavy load program, you know, I don't necessarily see that the pathological area changes. I change some of the maybe the loading properties, of the tissue around it. Is it that basically in the in that pain science model or that diagram that we looked at at the first course in the first hour of I'm be able to better modulate the neural system's ability to downregulate the pain through repetitive loading and habituation? That model's not mentioned in this, but it's good to keep it in the back of our mind. We're seeing that, but we're not necessarily seeing this mechanical change. And they saw that too, because it's an interesting study. You know, and so they, they, when they used to atom bomb test back in the, uh, let's say the, the 40s and 50s. It, there's like a carbon 17, I believe it is, that, and it's in this research or in these studies that was released at that period of time. And it's all in the atmosphere. And believe it or not, they can measure that in our tendons. And what they're able to kind of tell is that, you know, most, all of our tendon was laid down by the age of 17. Because what they can do is they can take samples of your tendon throughout the lot, your lifespan, and they can carbon date that, that C17 molecule to get a sense of when it was laid down. And, you know, they can see that, hey, look at Abby's tendon. His tendon was laid down and it was Abby now. Abby's probably 43. Uh, so, you know, it was laid down. Hey, this was laid down, you know, 20, 26 years ago in Abby's tendon. So they can see that we don't necessarily lay down new tendons. An individual, sort of collagen, let's say, as measured in the carbon 17 data. There's all these other physical elements that go into tendons. It's not necessarily that we're laying down and getting new collagen. That's based on some of the C bomb studies they've done on tendon, which I, you know, I just thought that was kind of rather interesting. Yeah, in fact, Abby's 40. She's still dealing with a. And again, now we just talked about where is the right loading curve? It's kind of what we were talking about before. It's like, okay, we want a loading program for this individual. Say, okay, now we're going to adjust the global movement pattern, you know, can and what's going on. The hip's got to move well so that I'm not getting a maladaptive load within the Achilles tendon. You know, so we have that global treatment of that etiology that's contributing. But we also need to then say, what is the, what is the ideal loading response that we need in this tendon so that we have a healthy cyclic brain. And this is a curve from the article talking about that maladaptive response. We have that maladaptive response to overstimulation, which is they're finding maybe in that greater than 9% of that cyclic strain where now all of a sudden, you know, we have these different, you know, chemical expressions and gene expressions that go on. This maladaptive response to overstimulation. You know, there's this adaptive homeostasis, which is going to say, okay, Here's where is my sweet spot in loading. Whereas I load the tendon at this 6% of its cyclical strain, I get these normalized or positive responses within the tendon expression. Okay, I have a normal load here. I need to lay down, you know, more type co one collagen, an RNA expression, you know, collagenase expression. Because it's moving this stress strain curve further to the right so that this tendon can take more load. And then the maladaptive response to understimulation. So now I have understimulation tendon, and there's no load through the tendon. So I have a negative response if I have no strain in the tendon. And that's kind of the, the trade-off when we look at, hey, I'm gonna put somebody in a boot for a while and I'm gonna not load this tendon. You know, again, yeah, I get the inflammatory portion of it down. I make it that intracellular tendon swelling down because of you know, now there's less stress through it and I reset it. But the trade off is going to be with this maladaptive response. If it's good, well, or I get somebody who gets, they have a distal fracture somewhere and it's either they have a boot on and they're not, they're not loading for six or eight weeks. You know, one of the things I need to consider is this tendon, this tendon region, now not having load. And there will be this. So in that individual, this gradual tending reloading response, we want to. And again, this idea of this mechanos at that point, which I think if you just read this article quickly, is it gets kind of confusing. And that mechanos mechanos that point, they're really referring to that green area in this line of we're all different. Where this green area occurs and this loading response is different 
in individuals. It's different in how we train. So this, this positive stress strain curve will be different on different individuals. But if we're looking at treating the tendon, building capacity and somebody wants to do more, we're looking at moving this stress strain curve further to the right so this person can take more load and be in that adaptive homeostatic response area. So any of our heavy loading, high resistance, eccentric programming we're doing, what we're really looking to do is to take this stretch strain curve and shift it to the right. Michelle, we were talking, what was the, the tendonopathy that that runner have in the case that we talked about last week? I'm drawing a blank on it right now since I'm in the middle of this. Uh, yep. which one did we do last week? Did I? Yeah, a 40 year old man, a little bit overweight for running, return to running. Oh, he had um, glute tendinopathy. Yeah, gluteal tendinopathy. So he was one that had that, that posterior gluteal tendinopathy. So the first thing we can assume we learned earlier, it's compressed. He had, take, he had taken time off of running and had come back to it. And he's a bit overweight, so the forces are going to go up in there and ignoring his running mechanic completely for now. You know, we can think about the stress strain curve and that where, okay, he took time off running. So where this curve may have been further shifted to the right, let's say for the gluteal tendon or any, any other tendon, he's been on the couch eating Cheetos for the past two years, his curve is going to be shifted to the left. So the, the tendon's ability to take strain is going to be significantly less than what he was used to when he was marathoning before. But like most people, we want to go back to where we were, not where we are. So he starts off and he gets back into training at a higher load level. And now all of a sudden, though his tendon before could take, you know, the strain, what was normally a 6% cyclical strain in him is now a 9% cyclical strain because of his body weight and lack of conditioning. So now he's in that maladaptive overstimulation phase, even though he's doing the same training he was doing. His tendon changed underneath of him, even though he's continuing to do the same training. So now his tendon is overloaded. So this mechanical stress points. You have to understand that, that sweet spot in that load once we're triggering. Again, pain associated, you know, with disuse, the understanding that, okay, yeah, you know, this is kind of a negative effect on muscle strain, the kinetic chain function. You get pain in one of these tissues, your whole cortical map changes. So now all of a sudden you got, let's say in this case, we're talking about this guy with uh, Achilles tendon pain we're going to go back to. Cortical map changes, absolutely proven. Transcranial stim, they've looked at that. Achilles tendon pain, your brain map changes, and now it's negatively affected kinetic chain function and muscles. In the runner's case here, probably what happened is they hit pain, changed his cortical map. Now trying to drive from maybe the Achilles in the lower leg more, and it's overloaded and moved his curve into an overload phase because of that. Or if he hadn't run recently, then it could be in the lower phase. That would be most likely the abnormal adaption of his, of his biomechanics. Running is very hip driven, where gait is more ankle driven. So that 40 toll of runner with hip pain, trying to compensate with an ankle strategy, probably gonna overload his Achilles tendon. So I hate to say it, Chan is right. I won't, good. Again. What we're looking for here is, like in all our training programs, is the appropriate loading in the adaptive response phase to create positive change in the kind of step. We want to move that curve from the maladaptive one to the normal homeostasis, and here we're shifting that curve to the right. So our rehabilitation program, our training program, if we're running or doing CrossFit, we need to kind of move this curve over to the right. The, female crossfitter with lateral extensor tendon pain. We may have a abnormal motor control pattern. Maybe it's going from her hip, maybe it's her back. She's compensating with the tendon, tendon gets overloaded. One is a PT is what we need to do is be able to address the global pattern that may be driving it. Finding the, bi finding the biomechanical stressors is what you're gonna do this weekend. And then, then now we're into the loading phase. Okay, I still have a dysfunctional tendon. Chan addressed the hip. He's got those mechanics cleaned up. We're addressing that. But we're still left with a dysfunctional tendon, which, okay, we need to find what is the right adaption, homeostatic loading program to build capacity. You know, if we're looking at posterior tip tendon, 
and we got to figure out, okay, if they're in a grade two and they start to get midfoot collapse or overpronation, I need to address that external stressor before I start building capacity. So it can, there's, there are a lot of variables and Eric's great at this. So I have no question you're going to take these things and run with Eric, but understanding does here's where we are in our rehabilitation process and why we're looking at loading programs where we want to move the curve. Chris, does this curve make sense to you? I see you unmuted. But you got no voice. Ah, uh, now you're muted again, Chris. Give it another try. Go ahead. No microphone. Kevin, you're a man of many opinions. What have you got? Yeah, Dave, it makes sense to me. Short and sweet. What loading program to use for Achilles tendinopathy? I've more kind of shifted my opinion away from eccentrics only. Um, really got into the research of the heavy slow. So I would say I load it with all three. Okay. I do concentric, eccentric, as well as isometrics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, it seems where the research has kind of trended, has it? It's that first it was, okay, eccentric load was it. And then they're like, well, wait a second here. Heavy load has some real value. And I think heavy load more recently has shown to be maybe a little bit better than eccentric. And then some people are like, oh, let's hold on now. Maybe concentric has value too. And, you know, why we kind of get all over the place with this, because somewhere where we want to be is this adaptive homeostatic model. We want to be what gives us the best chance at the sweet spot. But think of also why maybe the eccentric and some of the heavy load work may work. It's because we have high tensile stress. If we warm the tendon up, even if it's an intertendinous compression model, that idea of that slow strain or that slow compression is more likely to then or look at talk looking to is move, like moving the fluid out of the tendon versus if we go into plyometrics, i.e. running, jumping, then we're rapidly loading and compressing the tendon, which when we do that creates rapid tension within the tendon. So that one doesn't work as well as we do it. Because it's intertendon is compressive model of increased fluid or uh, you know basically a area of fibrosis that's just creating compression. Rapid model just works. So it makes sense. That Dave, that's where my brain went when I started looking at this. Like I was thinking more of a return to running program, yeah. you know, like slowly mm -hmm. loading and intervals and grading load at 10%. So is this only talking about a load like um, concentric, eccentric, isometric, like Kevin was saying, or can we apply the same model to like plyometric loading? I think you have to look at this because you eventually have to get them back to plyometric loading. So like with this loading model, you're gonna we're gonna do that to a degree. Idea is that you think about that stretch strain. If I put the strain rapidly into the tendon, you know, depending on this individual, it's how well do they adapt to it. So somebody who's coming, let's say it's the Achilles and not being a 42-year-old runner, I know that if I take them and I try to make him an immediate four-foot runner, it's probably gonna go really poorly. But over 12 weeks, I could probably make him a runner with a graded loading program and sequential progression. I would probably end up doing is making him a midfoot runner. And the reason why is that with the heel landing and the forefoot contact at the same time, I'm going to decrease initial vertical ground reaction force, smoothing out the curve. And the Achilles tendon doesn't have to accept that first initial load. If I, if I increase the hip drive in this individual, and maybe it's a glute and hamstring activation in the early portion of stance, I'm going to decrease the amount of Achilles tendon load that may, or the, the increase, the, the, the load rate of the Achilles tendon during that portion of the gait cycle. So yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to have to get this person back to running, but I'm going to try and modify these loads. So at first, how can I decrease some of the, the, the speed of loading of the Achilles tendon is what I want to be able to modify in this individual, if that makes sense, which is that plyometric moment of the Achilles tendon. And I want it working in harmony with the other muscles that are active during its loading phase. Because running is a, a ballistic motion in that range. 
Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. You know, the other thing, the concept that I chatted about with this with a little bit Michelle the other night was that, uh, you know, again, even with the Achilles, you know, we don't often think about it, but if I'm going to unload the Achilles and maybe the gait cycle, we don't often think about it, but the swing speed of the opposite leg coming through will, in essence, decrease some of the Achilles load. I don't have any research on it, but it holds true, right? And you can, and you can tell the difference is that, you know, it's sometimes what happens is we the Achilles gets painful. We load that leg a little bit longer because we don't want to generate force through it. But that other leg swinging through gets the body weight coming over the foot faster. And it decreases the maybe the load and pull force that the Achilles has to deal with. So that, that plyometric loading phase, there's many ways we can kind of decrease it. So I'm going to work on the foot strike, where it is in relation to their body, how quickly it's coming through. And even, really enough, swing speed of the leg is will decrease some of that loading force. And hopefully keep them in that green zone. So now I'm in, I can train them this more adaptive homeostatic region versus my foot hits the ground and I walk through it and then I over dorsiflex because I didn't want to fire the calf muscle because my Achilles hurts. Now I over dorsiflex and I compress the distal tendon into the calcaneus. So it can feed into it. So to some degree, I think plyometrics are valuable. We need to get back to them to get into load transfer. What, uh, what Ebony Rio did in her study where she looked at that eight phase Achilles rehab and dancers is that rather than doing the plyometric footwork on stairs to uh, the, whatever the dance beat that was very common for warm ups for the Australian uh, dance troupe, because they needed to load the Achilles at a certain tempo to be able to go back to dance. And that's a cortically driven model that, okay, we need to be able to kind of load that Achilles. So plyometrics needs to be a part of that return to sport, just a matter of when we introduce it. And if he's a 42-year-old runner who's not going to stop running in the presence of this, then I'm definitely going to play with how do I modify that plyometric load with foot strike, pull through, and even if I have to, I can get into swing speed. And that's what it is. That, I, that changes in the tendon may contribute to, but enough will explain improved athletic performance, i.e. the tendon may not have changed, but their athletic performance and their pain may have gone down. You know, musculature and nervous system and other connective tissues that contribute to that personal, you know, level adaptation. So that idea that that person is in the pathology, multiple factors would kind of go in. Put in some of the data on collagen synthesis, and this may not be as germane to where we are now, that you're going to see changes and markers in these tendons immediately after exercise. And you can think about that in a sense that we see collagen synthesis markers 24 hours post exercise. It's the stacking of workouts which can be problematic for some people. That idea that, okay, I did a long run yesterday, last night, and I'm going to come back and I'm going to do a hard plyometric workout in the morning. That the tendons you'll see, and even they even see this, the same research holds true in disc. You see disc changes and fluid content changes every coverage over 24 hours. And there can be a summation effect. I've seen it in triathletes over the years where they stack too many high high distance or intense workouts close to each other because now all of a sudden we're, you know you have this common increase in collagen degradation markers and enzymes that are detected within that 24 hour to 72 hour period they don't recover enough they come back and hit it again now you get this increased degradation of these markers again so spacing and timing of these workouts then becomes kind of really important i'd go to if they're younger in their 30s and, and 20s like a 36 hour pace. If they want to do two days in a row that are like higher, higher loading workouts, I'd at least try sometimes I almost space it out by 36 hours. So morning on a Monday, afternoon on a Tuesday. And I think what happens is you're seeing that in the collagen, the muscle recovery, that some of these markers that recover for 24 hours, that extra 12 hours really helps out. Now they're really hardcore about it and they're training for something specific and the timing based on just these synthesis markers that you'll see post-exercise, you know, it's being aware that kind of helps. And this is why we're going to space out these workouts because there is increased fluid and there's increased, you know, digestive enzymes within these structures in that first 24 hours or so. So if we space it out a little bit, your tendon gets a chance to recover to a baseline where we apply that stress load again. 
if you think about it, it's the model they use it when they kind of, those of you who've done instrument assisted salt tissue mobilization, this is exactly kind of what they talk about that, hey, you're gonna do the A-stim or grassing technique on a Monday, you're gonna give them to a Thursday or a Friday to do it again. Not, has anyone heard anything different or is that how you're taught this? Who here does any kind of instrument assisted work? Volunteer yourself up. Before I pick on Ariel. Stephanie, you doing any soft tissue assisted breast in, ASTEM? Yes, I do Graston, and that's what they kind of taught us in the course as well. Yeah. To have that kind of um, period in between the sessions that you would do. Yeah. And it's kind of that idea that you're trying to traumatize the tendon. So you're almost in some ways, you know, in, in more of a positive way, they're thinking about it. It's traumatizing that tendon now. They still teach it as being a mechanical effect in Graston, or they talk more again, about the, the tissue, uh, you know, the, the fibroblast formation growth factor bruising effect that happens. Yeah, a little bit. Um, I had a truncated version of it, so we didn't go as in depth about what kind of the um, underlying properties of it. Um, but I believe the I only have the M one in for grass, and I think M two they might do a little bit more of the mechanical or kind mm -hmm. of like I think they do movement with grass in in the M two, um, okay. but I have not taken that one yet, so okay. it might go a little bit more in depth on that one. Yeah, but that is essentially kind of what they're looking at now is more the tissue. It's not so much you're breaking up fibrotic tissue. It's that you're stimulating basically this this process of controlled bruising and, and tissue, re, and, and, and tissue whether it's remodeling in that standpoint, or you're trying to kind of jumpstart that hers with tendon strain and tendon load. I see, I think, you know, there's multiple things which work in that same element, whether you're looking at rock waves, the green little level laser maybe, there's other things that do that. In my notes here, you know, that's where I mentioned earlier the integration of new collagen. I talked about just to jump here a little bit, and it appears limited after skeletal development. They really talk about age 17 is what they do. I thought that was an interesting fact, too, that the collagen rate in the horses is 0.25% a year, which gives it a half life, meaning that you'll turn over half of your collagen in 200 years. If that model holds true to us, which probably does. So you can turn over half your collagen in the short period of time of 200. So this idea of, you know, being able to redevelop the collagen, you know, and lay down, you know, a new one is, is, it's a bit strained now. Types of collagen change, but don't necessarily get a new one. And that's that idea of it. Oh, I did reference it, but it's carbon-14, where you kind of look at relative age of the tendon, because they can see that, they can measure this, and that most of the C14 levels were laid down at, you were 17 Thought was increased that the increased tendon dimensions in response to exercise have consistently been observed in younger patients. That you know now loading our tendon at younger ages, you know, does it have significant value for later in life? That loading in those younger periods and getting that stimulus, does that does doing the exercise and having this load, you know, give you more capacity? They don't know. You know, there's not been that uh, longitudinal study done per se. But you know, would it be optimal to you know, be more active when you're younger to you have more tendon capacity? The only thing I think this is my, this is pure opinion is that i you see some of this. I think the people who are some of the more successful four foot runners are the ones who ran in high school and college, and you know, it's more thing. I think it's because they they they've been having that adaptive change in the, in the system in the body, you know, in those formative years. So that their collagen strength in the system may be reflected in that. I don't think it's solely it, but it is an interesting concept to think about. That those people who may have been more active in that period, maybe those people that more naturally adopted. Those people adopted later because of ground reaction force issues and others, they are the ones who may have to balance the Achilles tendinopathy, hamstring tendinopathies, because they they their body did not adapt maybe in the formative years because they weren't playing soccer or other loading sports. Yeah, it's about that critical. Oh. 
And again, it's important to state here that the absence of change tendon in cross-sectional area over life not reflect the absence of tissue-based adaptation. There's going to be tissue-based adaptation. And then adopts a different mechanism that both scale around. Could be other well, matrix and other things that they're looking at. And, you know, as being properties, not just the you know cross-sectional area of the tendon. That's an idea here. So let's say in case one and case two, you know, you know, are we changing in the in the really tendon case and the elbow tendinopathy? Are we really changing? What are we changing in these individuals? And again, here what they're saying is that you know newer studies suggest that these transient changes, there's these transient changes that occur in tendons. And that idea that, okay, with that runner in that crossfitter, you know, what we need to do is we need to find their optimal sweet spot in loading. Because in this case, we are going to get different things. We're going to get tendon tissue free, you know, and there's changes immediately after work on the basal elastic properties of tendon. So a tendon may have a little bit more length. So that runner, I think what we may see is that we're thinking about tissue creep. You know, oftentimes, you know, is anyone here in Achilles seen Achilles tendinopathy and noted that sometimes that these individuals, aren't always necessarily tight, that they tend to sometimes be have excessive range. Of yeah, right now I actually have a gentleman with kind of bilateral Achilles mm -hmm. tendinopathy and yeah. he's got 12 to 15 degrees of dorsiflexion. Yeah, so what you're seeing here is only the bullet point too, is this excessive tissue creep that occurs, that weakening of that matrix Again, allows that tendon to creep and it's going to have influences. Like he may actually be weak at the old plantar flexion, like a one foot, because he can't generate proper length tension relationship within the tendon muscular structure. And oftentimes you'll find that these people here, they get, get breakdown of, that, of the system and, and lengthening. Now, he'll also be prone to that compressive model because he has excessive dorsiflexion now. You know, basically the tendon in the deep fibers of the tendon in particular tend to become then compressed against the calcaneus. And that's that compressive model that occurs. But as often as I'll find sometimes these people, it's not like, oh, I need to stretch out. You, you want to stretch because that stretching and elongation has that pain modulatory effect temporarily. But, you know, the problem is not that they need to be stretched. It's the fact that this thing is probably excessively, you have some tissue creep going on here over lengthening. That breakdown then can contribute to either the compressive tendinopathy or that mid substance, that's, those fibers that have to move around that pathological area can't transfer sufficient load because they don't have the proper stiffness. And they'll address the idea of stiffness in this article. And it's debated whether you know stiffness as being the thing you need to improve your condition, or is it relevant, or is it you know less stiffness? It's it's somewhat up for debate. Role of stiffness. idea of where, okay, you know, if I have a tendon, where's the optimal loading properties? Where a tendon is too soft or too stiff, you know, may put this tendon at risk for injury. That really clears things up to know that, hey, it's kind of the Goldilocks thing. You know, I could have a, t you know, a bed that's too soft or a bed that's too firm, you know, and I'm not going to be comfortable with tendons. You know, yeah, is this tendon too soft? And sometimes is this tendon too stiff? So it, don't think of this as being confusing. Think of it as being liberating and that, you know, take the patient that you see and kind of be ready to accept what they give you. This person may be, you know, they may have a lot of stiffness. So we may want to, we may want to then approach, okay, a graded adaptation, lengthening under load to improve strength through range of motion may benefit that person. The individual that Patrick saw has excessive length, but we need to control that length and a dorsiflex. So that it's a movement pattern control because if they load every time they run, and they drop rapidly into dorsiflexion, they're gonna be loading the Achilles tendon. They need to kind of neutralize their position. Like they may do well with a whole color, some of the some heel elevation in their shoe. With an elevated heel versus something stiff, maybe they may a flatter shoe or you know, adaptation maker. So again, it's unclear whether stiff tendons or less stiff tendons are desirable in endurance athletes. Because you know, just keep that that open mind that take what comes your way and assess them for who they are. You have the, you may have an expectation that it's stiff or loose when you don't find it. Work on the model that makes sense. 
and address what you think may be the stressor. In some cases, you have to kind of flip your model. Again, rehabbing tendons specifically, you know, global models are helpful to change movement patterns. But if we're looking at moving that tendon stress strain curve, that targeted uh, muscular tendons unit interventions tend to have the greatest effect on the mechanical properties, mechanical loading of the tendon. So a global system approach may work for some, but really to get those adaptive changes in the tendon, you need a specific tendon loading, you know, aponeurotic tendon mechanical loading program to really create those changes. And that, you know, they look at these, you know, pretty things. So if we're doing plyometric training, running, since it is such a multi-joint functional system, you know, we may not be getting adequate load to build capacity within a specific muscular tendinous unit. And that's the, the argument for specific loading programs for the tendon as being a component in the rehabilitation program, as well as looking at the whole person and the whole movement pattern. Because that's going to be your long view. I need to create capacity. That is your 12-week program. You know, make acute changes by treating the entire system and moving stress strains around. Got to be more of an immediate adaptation. Of Skip over some things here because we are out of time. Again, real quick here, it's, you have my notes. I'm going to go over local effects. You know, decrease compression when we can. Decrease dorsiflexion. Release loading. Patrick's patient. You know, heavy, heavy, slow resistance, you know, also give better results, you know, than high-speed exercises. The reasons we talked about, heavy, slow resistance gives the tendon time to react. It doesn't increase the intertendinous pressure or the tensile forces rapidly. So early progressions, heavy, slow resistance, better result in high speed exercises initially. And that's because of the associated lower intertendon is dynamic pressures that occur with slow, heavy resistance versus dynamic plyometrics. Uh, what's out there too is interesting is, you know, drug treatments, you know, directly targeting elevated you know, gag chemicals, which pull fluid in into the tendon. So they're looking at this you know, hyaluronic, hyaluronic, the same kind of acid, hyaluronic acid, a form of it they use that we've seen in, in knee, knee injection joint injection. But they find that basically what this does is, is in decreasing these other chemical stew, it takes the intracellular fluid levels and can balance back to what is pre-injury levels. So we're not retaining as much fluid and we get less compression. And that's the compression. Woo. I hope that wasn't terribly painful for everyone. <laughs>